Hello, my name is Selena Rogers Dickerson. I'm the owner of Starport LLC, which is a civil and transportation engineering services company headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. I am also the owner of Selene LLC, which is a diverse business solutions company also headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. We specialize with that firm in helping consultants and contractors and organizations meet or exceed their minority participation goals. Today, in our Know Your Business Summit, I am bringing to you a discussion on the great resignation and being prepared for 2022. We also have a special guest, Mr. Eric Morrison from Bear Properties to tell us about an exciting new project called the Hardwick that's happening in Birmingham. They're looking for contractors, minority contractors to meet or exceed their DBE participation goal. And we want you to hear it from here on what you need to do to be able to participate. So sit back, get your notebook out, take notes, because what you're about to hear can be pivotal and critical to your longevity going into 2022. Let's get ready. How are you, Eric? Good. Good, Selena. Good morning. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, you and I just recently met, and I appreciate everything that you said and in, in what Bear Properties is doing to be inclusive in the Hartwick Project. So what I want to do, because I understand what your, what your need is and what your goal is, and I applaud the efforts that you are personally making and your team is making to be inclusive in our in our city. So could you give us a little information about the Hardwick and the kind of contracting types that you're looking for? So and what people need to do in order to get started or submit their information to their properties to be ready for this project? Sure. Well, thank you so much, uh, Selena. And yeah, it's uh, it was great to meet you just a few weeks ago. And um, obviously, this is our second meeting since just meeting. And uh, I look forward to continued, you know, collaboration and um, working to figure out um, our inclusive program uh, along with your help. And thank you for the opportunity uh, here to talk about the Hardwick. Um, I have a slide deck um, that I uh, can pull up on the screen. There, there it is. Uh, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go through it really kind of quickly, just to give the overall project program, um, so we can okay. talk a little bit more about the the impact portion of it. Um, so the Hardwick is a historical renovation project located on the Rotary Trail, uh, First Avenue South and 23rd Street uh, in downtown. Um, and if everybody can sort of just take a mental visual snapshot of what that looks like on the screen uh, versus what um, the building looks like today. Um, so, like I said, historical renovation project, it's a 110 year old building, um, uh, obviously needs a lot of help, uh, but it's got, it's a great canvas on which to execute a project like this. Um, the history of the building was um, over the course of time, it's been everything from a grain and seed warehouse to a janitorial supply company to a, um, a fabricated steel um, processing plant. Um, uh, great, like I said, great canvas uh, to, to execute a project like this. Um, a lot of vertical and horizontal potential from a space standpoint, a lot of great art artifacts inside the building to reuse and help tell the story of the history of the building. Um, it's going to be a mixed use project with a mixture of office and restaurant space. Um, it'll be about uh, 48,000 rentable square feet of office, uh, class A office, top of the market space, and about 10,000 square feet on the ground level of restaurant space. Um, like I said, I'll get to it a little bit more in, in, at, towards the end here about uh, more of our impact program, but I will say now from the very start, this project has been designed along the lines of ESG, um, environmental and social governance. Um, you know, so a few features that sort of, um, that sort of play into that. Uh, uh, we are going to be seeking well certification for this project, um, which is um, well is about how the building um, uh, environment treats its occupants. Uh, we will have solar panels, we'll have car charging, um, we will be fully embracing the uh, location on Rotary Trail. So uh, maximum um, opportunity for uh, walkability, um, biking to work, things of that nature, being able to work out during lunch, on, take advantage of Rotary Trail and the walkable neighborhood that surrounds it. Um, um, high efficiency HVAC units with uh, uh, top, filtration, top filtration. Um, and that's just some of the stuff on the E side of ESG. Um, the social stuff, I'll, go, I'll get to more in a minute um, after I get through sort of the, the building presentation, um, but obviously equally important. 
Um, also part of the impact of the project is uh, what this project will do um, for the surrounding neighborhood and um, in creating a social um, civic commons. Um, as you can see right there, you know, you got an old building, you saw that picture earlier. Um, in conjunction with the old building is old hardscape and old roadways around the building, you know, um, older non-existent landscaping, non-existent lighting, things of that nature, street lighting. Um, so really, you know, improving public property surrounding the building um, that benefits not only this project, but um, the neighborhood overall. And then, of course, proximity to Rotary Trail and then how that plays into um, the overall civic commons, really bolstering the trail, bolstering um, what the trail can do for the city and this neighborhood as sort of a central, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of waypoint um, for pedestrians using the overall trail system coming through the city. Um, Powell Avenue, just north of the project and the north side of the project, as you can see from that, that prior um, shot is dilapidated. Uh, it's in terrible condition. It's not a functioning roadway. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of a major undertaking with the city of Birmingham um, and Norfolk Southern Railway to um, uh, vacate some portions and um, get everybody's property rights squared away so we can so we can improve these civic commons and improve Powell Avenue um, and, you know, make the back of the building and the street, Powell Avenue, 23rd Street, look like this instead of what it looks like now. Um, and like I said, um, part of that civic commons um, serve as a parallel feeder to Rotary Trail. Here's a shot, um, kind of another aerial shot here of what the um, overall program will look like. Like I mentioned, ground floor restaurants will be um, really on the left or the west side of the building. Um, with some ground floor office on the right east side of the building and then the second and third floors um, above it. Um, you know, playing once again to this whole civic commons um, idea. Uh, this this um, rendering was actually done very on and very early on in the uh, in, in the throes of COVID uh, in the summer of 2020. So um, as you can see, the rendering artist took some liberties based off of exactly what was going on in the world at that time. Where everybody's eating outside because you couldn't eat inside. Um, but this still plays and works very well for what we're trying to accomplish going forward, even in a post-COVID world where you can't eat inside, um, activating, this, the, activating the city streets and creating, creating a, um, a public gathering place and, and a civic commons and really um, um, having the general public be able to kind of come together, not just inside of a building, but in an overall neighborhood. Uh, here's a shot coming in off of 23rd Street. Uh, this is, uh, we, we call this a forecourt. Some people might call, call it an atrium. We don't like to use the word atrium. Um, but uh, it, it, it exemplifies, uh, like I was saying earlier, one of the, uh, the vertical opportunities that this project gives us to expand. Uh, this is the west bay of the building. Um, and as you can see, it's very tall. Um, right now, it's only one story um, on grade. But uh, we have the opportunity to expand it up to three floors and truly mix both uses in this building between office and restaurant. Right in front of you, you see ground floor restaurant and above you is office space. Behind you would be a restaurant. To the right of you would be office space. And all three entrances, all three entrances to the building come together, um, confluence here in this center spot. Um, so really a true mixture of uses where a lot of mixed use projects and buildings don't really mix their uses. They typically have separate entrances and things of that nature. Here's a cut through the building to kind of show the scale and. And, and what we have planned for it. Um, here's a shot from the larger restaurant space on the north side of the building and what that can look like, uh, really embracing the historical nature of the building, kind of but kind of bringing it up to speed for um, current day. Uh, floor plan, uh, once again, uh, the three entrances that I mentioned here, that central spine, and then the entrance off 23rd Street, all coming together right here, the main elevator core, um, an art feature, common restrooms, once again, really mixed, mixing the uses and the um, inhabitants of the building. Uh, here's a shot of what that, um, that central spine I just showed you can look like, uh, really embracing, once again, the vertical um, opportunity to take advantage of, um, you know, two-story heights, uh, natural light, bringing natural light into the building as part of, part of uh, well certification is natural light, clean air, access to um, um, exercise opportunities. Here's the second floor, all office space, um, open to below, being able to see the, the forecourt from above, and then the third floor. Um, we'll also have an outdoor patio here that'll overlook Rotary Trail. Once again, just sort of embracing the street up to the, you know, up to the top of the building. 
And just a quick shot, just kind of showing the capabilities of Bear Properties, what we're capable of. This is the Pizitz building. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it, have been to it. Um, this is what it looked like before we got our hands on it. And then, of course, this is what it looks like afterwards. Um, you know, so just sort of showing, hey, we're, we can do projects like this. Uh, we can execute. They're not easy, but they're fun. Uh, and projects like this, the Pizitz building, and then we believe the Hardwick as well, will be hugely impactful projects for the city of Birmingham um, in a way that it attracts national and even international attention to the city. It helps make the city cool. It helps draw people here. It becomes an attraction. Um, you know, it becomes a beacon for the city. Um, so now that I've kind of gone through the whole the whole project and the program, I um, uh, want to talk a little bit more about the social side of ESG and the social side of, of what we're trying to accomplish here with, with making this an impactful project. Um, uh, a big part of that is uh, the diversity um, of uh, our design, construction, and development teams. Uh, we are currently um, in the process of working with um, HBCUs to bolster internship programs on the design, construction, and development teams. Um, but, a, but a bigger lift seems to be, and Selena and I have talked about this at length in a, in a couple of different forums, um, a bigger challenge, at least that, I, that it's been expressed to me, is, um, is minority contracting, um, NWDBE contractors. Uh, and um, the pool of those contractors being small. And that is what has been communicated to me. Now, I have not experienced it directly yet because we haven't gone through the bidding process yet, although we're about to. Um, but we do have goals here around minority, partic minority participation. Uh, we want to be able to maximize minority participation. And um, um, just along those lines, I'm being told that, you know, the, like I said, the pool is small, the pool of qualified contractors who have the proper bonding capacity and insurance and, and size to handle project scope of this size. Um, and when I say that, I often get a response from the minority community that, hey, no, we're out here, right? We're here. But then I hear from the contracting community that well, we don't know where they are. So it seems to be, I'm learning in pretty short order that there's just not an overlap. So what I'd like to kind of, what I'm trying to talk about here today and what Selena and I have been talking about thus far is how do we bring these two groups together? How do we create more overlap? Um, and we would love to um, meet as many uh, MWDBE contractors as possible um, and give them the opportunity to bid on this project and become part of the team. Uh, Stuart Perry Construction is our general contractor, and they are 100% on board with trying to accomplish this and maximize that participation. Um, so uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me at uh, emorrison at bearproperties.com, that's uh, E as in Eric. M is a Mary, O-R-R-I-S-O, -R -R -S -S and is a Nancy at BearProperties.com. Be happy to connect you with um, our contracting team and uh, work towards uh, work towards um, getting you part of the team. Thank you so much, Eric. That is phenomenal. Um, I take my daughter to Rotary all the time, and to see what it will be is is amazing. You know, the heart rate, the building itself. You know, as it exists, it's a nice building, but I am looking forward to the opportunity to to just explore some of the nice restaurants that might be there or sit out in the open seating. And the fact that you are trying to be inclusive and, do, and being committed to that now, uh, it's appreciated within the AEC community. And so contractors, you know, this is your shot. You're, you're getting information early. So... You know, it's a great segue into what we're going to talk about as far as HR and, and the manpower that you need, but take advantage of this information. Be proactive in contacting Stuart Perry Construction and Bear Properties. Uh, Eric is giving you his contact information, so reach out. You know, they're, they're serious about this, and so let's, let's move forward and do our part and be responsive to the opportunities that has been presented. Thank you, Eric, for your time. Yeah. And I look forward to working with you in Bear Properties to get this, meet this goal. Absolutely. Thank you, for me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. So that is an interesting segue to making sure that we're ready for 2022. We've talked a lot about 
in the news, the change in workplace and workforce and how COVID has changed what the workplace looks like. There are a lot of things that we have seen that have happened over the course of the last 18 months and employee retention might be one of the things that we have to deal with. But how do we get beyond that? Now, I've seen posts and articles and op-eds about it's just the fault of the business owner. Well, sometimes it's a little bit different for small businesses. And that might be because we don't know. It may be because we don't have the resources. And a lot of times it might be because we can't compete with the larger salaries that large firms can do or large businesses can do. And so today's panel discussion is to give you some insight on practical things that have been seen out in the workplace, as well as solutions and, and managing those risks that we take as small business owners. So I'm going to present to you today, uh, Mr. Jagil Duggar from Pi. And Jagil and I met by him being proactive. We haven't known each other in maybe six months or so, but because he was proactive in reaching out to me and I just committed to being a part of his team to help him get to his goals. But he it brings a, an interesting perspective for businesses that are in the retail and restaurant space. And so I want Jagil to come on board and just tell you a little bit about, about himself, his company, and then Jagil, give us an example of some of the challenges that you've seen in the workplace for small businesses as far as employee retention and turnover. Thank you, Selena, for having me on the show. And it's, it's been a pleasure to, to work with you and, and, and meet you and, uh, and, and consider you a friend. And, uh, and, and I appreciate it. And really looking at what we're facing right now, dealing with COVID and prior to COVID, Pi is on a mission to empower small and large businesses by improving three key components. And those key components are labor efficiency, safety, and reducing customer wait time. We do this by developing and engineering an automated payment technology system, most would consider the name of uh, a kiosk. And when we, one thing Selena talked about is you talk about labor shortages and the issues that businesses are facing across the country and, and also across the world for, for that matter. Uh, and, and we talk a lot about uh, jobs and increasing wages, but we need to talk a little bit about what we're seeing from a business owner perspective. Uh, go Going back to 2012, since the fight for 15 started, uh, we've seen a lot of things change from a technology standpoint. And one of those key components that we've seen change is, for example, we've seen Walmart implement self-checkout in, in around 2013. Uh, we've seen uh, McDonald's implement self-ordering kiosk around the year 2015. And uh, we've seen them prepare themselves and spend millions and billions of dollars on automated payment technology. And for those of you who don't know, I think you should definitely consider when you go to your local grocery store, whether it be a Publix or whether it be a McDonald's and you experience the self-checkout process. So Pi has developed and engineered that same technology. We develop a complete solution in intellectual property, both hardware and software, to be able to help small businesses. We create an affordable self-ordering solution and, and talking to our customer base uh, across the country, and we do have international customers as well, uh, we, we are able to help them uh, to be able to overcome some of the issues that they are facing with labor shortages, with, with some of their workers being sick with COVID. We're able to put them in a futuristic place and automate a lot of their processes to make their labor more efficient. And we're also able to put them in a place to where they can also be able to uh, reduce customer wait time and offer a safer uh, work environment by by reducing the person-to-person -person communication between the customer and the cashier. Uh, you'll also notice some of the big box restaurants such as Taco Bell has implemented this technology. A lot of what we're seeing is that a lot of these businesses, they're not able to operate uh, because of labor shortages. So I think a lot of what we understand now, we need to be able to uh, work with these small businesses and, and small businesses need to understand that times are changing and these are difficult times and technology such as what Pi offer can be able to help you to overcome some of the adversities that you're facing. 
Uh, and, and there's a reason why there's been self-checkout implemented in some of the big companies and they've spent the billions of dollars for all this. Oh, wow. So that's amazing within itself. I know that sometimes I get a little impatient and I might just go to the self-checkout line, but now I understand why it's there. Um, and it brings us at a crossroads. I, I know I've, I've had conversations with friends that live in uh, different cities, larger cities like DC, for example, who make it a point to use the cashier versus the automated self checkout, and and so you know because they believe in the value of of jobs and human capital. Um, but what I like to to get some insight on is um, I like to bring on board now Dr. Alice Gordon Holloway. And I would like for her to introduce herself, but at the same time, Dr. Holloway is professional in business strategy and risk management. And she's, she's seen it on the procurement side, as well as now helping to help small businesses mitigate some of those risks. And so when you look into, when you look at a situation like uh, Ms. Duggar was, was mentioning, Dr. Holloway, and how small businesses may be going into more automation or large businesses be going into more automation. How can small businesses mitigate some of their risk and challenges to when they might not be able to get into the automation or the self-checkout uh, where they think they might not be able to because maybe they just didn't know that uh, services like what Mr. Duggar offers exist. But what can they do if they're not ready to take that step to mitigate some of those risks? Well, first of all, thank you for having me um, this afternoon for your session. I'm really excited to be here. And, uh, and part of my, my research and what I do as a, as a management scholar uh, here at the University of Alabama and with my company, CEO of Sky Connect Incorporated, is that I talk to businesses and I look at firm data analysis and understand what's really happening in the, in the marketplace. And you're absolutely right that automation and innovation are taking kind of taking the, the flow, if you will, of what used to be. So I'm really excited to hear more about how automation and innovation technologies like this particular one that Pi has developed continues to be part of the small business organization. No longer can small businesses continue to um, sit by and just wait until new things are available to them and they try it later on. They have to become early adopters of this technology. There have to be early innovators who actually are considering how to you know, move the needle along as it relates to these processes. Um, part of my research is entrepreneurship in particular and looking at artificial intelligence, also looking at um, big data analysis and even business ethics and corporate governance. And when I look at all these different types, I also look at what's happening, what's threatening these organizations. And one key area is things they can't control, of course. And so there's this risk issue that they're trying to risk, manage their risk within this uncertain environment. So yeah, you mentioned earlier your, your conversation about the risk mitigation strategies and really looking at, you know, what's happening with this great resignation. Well, certainly you've got experts. I know who's going to talk more about that, but organizations such as small businesses have to continue to embrace technology and really be early adopters of it. Some of the things that I'm seeing is that, that, that there's this there's this push and pull where you see it's out there, you know there's technology, but you don't really adopt it for one. Number two, there's also these strategies of how employees are coming to these workplaces. So right now when people are, are finding these employees, um, they're finding them through all sorts of methods. But of course, technology allows them to connect the employer with the employee. And so that's a really critical, critical point as well. But what I'm also seeing is that firms are just not typically surviving some of these challenges and we want them to thrive and survive at the same time. And so I think there's a, a number of things they should be considering. And the first one is adopting technology in terms of what makes it easier to process payroll, what makes it easier to analyze the hours, what makes it easier to hire these individual people, what makes it easier to, to make sure that they can put bids in place and manage those bids throughout? Are there some systematic processes they can put in place where technology can take the place of a person if it requires them you know, to have uh, certain skill levels? I also think it's important for them to consider outsourcing, contracting other labor um, to be able to get their jobs done. Because right now, you know, there, there's conversation around how do we outsource more and still maintain our level of efficiency? And how do we 
offshore, which is another way that we're actually able to continue to improve the efficiency of the workplace. So those are two dynamics that looks at the contracting piece of that and also offshoring internationally even to make sure the job gets done for small businesses. So I don't want them to sit back and say, oh, I can't make these changes. Yes, you can adopt some of the same strategies and challenges that big firms are also in pl in putting in place in a small environment. So that's that's how I would say I would address some of those. That's that's awesome. Yeah, offshore green work is something that I've thought about, but ne not necessarily knew how to do. And uh, just last week, I was you were a speaker at this. I was at a at a, a an event or a course for so to speak a forum with other women entrepreneurs through what is Business Enterprise National Council and the number of questions that came up about uh, procedures, processes, best practices as it relates to human resources was was stellar. You know, and, and I found it ironic that I wanted to do this form about that same topic today. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a position to where sometimes we know that these things are possible, but we don't necessarily know how to do it. Right. And so now I want to bring on board Ms. Melba Tate from Tate and Associates, HR extraordinaire. You know, I, I sit on a lot of different boards and and I, every time I turn around, when it's an HR issue, Ms. Tate's name comes up. And she is the person in Birmingham to go to for your, your resources, your needs for HR. And so uh, Ms. Tate, as you've heard the discussion so far and you've heard Dr. Holloway's insight in it, and I've, believe you know how how committed she is to helping this small business be able to create capacity through strategy. Um, and hearing about uh, what Mr. Duggar has those things that he offers as well as um, the hard way, knowing what's about to happen, what processes do you think we could implement as far as our onboarding process and make sure we might be getting good personnel to start just as we move forward. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for calling me the, um, the HR fixer. I'm glad my name does show up. You know, that's our whole motto is that we cultivate people and the places that they work. So it is really a war on, on talent and it is hard to find that, that true talent that we need. And, um, but, but the talent is there. So we've got to just look a little bit deeper to find, um, those candidates that we need to help fulfill those mission, those projects, and move the mission forward. So listen, we are, I mean, the, the facts don't lie. I mean, we we had about 18 million people resign from their job um, between January to September of this year. Some of them decided to go in the gig economy. And um, I mean, that is a big industry itself where people are entrepreneurs or taking gig jobs as well as those who decided to look for another job that met their needs. And so I think in, in onboarding and sourcing the talent that organizations will need, they've got to look at exactly why people are leaving where they are right now. All of it is not pay. Um, some of it has to do with pay and the ability, but there are a number of other issues that people are leaving and looking for other opportunities, which those organizations like the Hartwick who may be looking to hire more people or organizations that are looking to hire more people should be well aware of so that they can address those issues on the front end and not the back end. So some of those studies have shown that um, child care is a big issue. Um, I know, you know, you opened up and you talked about COVID and the great resignation. People still fear COVID. And especially with the OSHA mandate that just came out with 100 plus employees um, requiring the vaccination or testing, that's going to cause a lot of shift as well. Um, people want time with their family. Uh, other people are looking at their commute, flexible hour, hours, and then just the value in how they can enhance and better themselves if they look to move to another job. So knowing those issues up front, I think the recruiters and, and um, any of the managers who are looking to add people to their team should be well aware of those obstacles that organizations are experiencing now and finding a way to address them. So, I mean, if you look at it, 
all industries are impacted. Of course, we all know retail and just hearing about the self-service stations. I use them simply because I want to get in and out. But retail is suffering. Hospitality is suffering. The leisure and travel industry is suffering. Um, manufacturing technology, which we did not think a couple of years ago because we were moving more people to those unique fields. And even healthcare, although they're they're top of the line positions that are available are even struggling to find people. So I do think once you find them, you want to keep them. One of the things that people don't realize is the cost to replace a person. There have been a lot of studies done that says if you're hiring someone at $60,000 a year, you lose that person, you may spend up to twenty dollars to $30,000, not all hard dollars, it could be just administrative costs, and trying to find that replacement. So I do think knowing those issues up front and then having some strategies in place to help deal with those issues um, are going to help mitigate some of the turnover and also some of the lag time in attracting the type of people that you need. I was going to just kind of piggyback on, on what Melva said. First of all, I'm, I'm really excited that, um, that I'm having this conversation because what I'm interested in wondering is that where are the people going? And so if they're, if they're changing up and moving away from some of those industries that Melva mentioned, where are they going? So as a researcher, I want to dig into understanding where is this mass migration? Certainly there are some people who are going to be entrepreneurs and go out and own their shingle and try it and make a go at, at this entrepreneurship. But there are some people who just say, hey, I, I do want, like Melba said, more time with my family. I now have a more educated. They may have been able to during COVID to get themselves a lot more refined in terms of their skill set. So they're trying different things out. But I'm certainly going to know what's going on. And certainly there's some research based so associated with the 16-year-olds, the 24-year-olds, and the population shrank and was shrinking for years, even prior to COVID. And then there's also this leadership gap of people between the ages of 45 and 54 that also shrank in terms of you know being in the workforce. So we need to go back and get those older people who are in the workforce as well and bring them back in while we're also trying to attract this new individual talent. So um, that that's really interesting to me is figure out where are the people going because we need them in the workplace and we can see it. When we go in stores and we shop and we, we have this experience because they're not there. Well, you know, Alice, for a long time, we were just for, for those of us who left the corporate world and went to entrepreneurship, we were just looked at lost individuals, you know, we were just no longer counted because they did not start counting us as an entrepreneur or a business owner. We were just lost to the workforce. So mm. I do think some new mechanisms have gone in place to be able to catch that. And that's why one of the studies that showed there are 57 million gig workers mm -hmm. who contribute to our economy, make it over a trillion dollars a year. So some of them may be still holding a, a regular job. Some of them, uh, again, some of the people who were in our traditional work environments are now working from home. So I do think that with the shift in COVID and people having to work remotely, some of those numbers hadn't quite shown up um, as right. yet. So I think we'll start to see what that picture looks like in maybe the next maybe 18 to 24 months. But right now, it is like we just lost a whole lot of people. And we know we lost, lost a lot of people to COVID. But all of them were not in the workforce at the time. Maybe half of them. I don't really know what that looks like. But mm -hmm. we've got to realize, even if we take half of the 700,000 of people that may have died from COVID and think that maybe half of them were actively employed, that may be three or 400,000 people that we lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to encourage those who are watching this program this afternoon that if you're interested in entrepreneurship and, and doing something that actually is your own enterprise, being your own boss, you can make that happen. Certainly, there are opportunities for us to, to be embracing. And as Melba said, there is a, a bigger community now of entrepreneurs who are out there who are saying, come on in. The water is fine. Certainly, I, I've been an entrepreneur for a number of years. I've started five businesses. Uh, very, very involved in that. As Elena mentioned, I'm very passionate about making sure sure I help businesses to be able to, to grow. I'm also looking at how the larger firms are embracing this population of people that Mel would talk about as well. So it's a fascinating concept, but I'm really excited that we're talking about it this afternoon. That, that's longer. So 
you all are phenomenal. I just want to say that first. Yeah, <laughs> the three of you are all rock stars in what you do, and I appreciate each one of you coming on. You know, and I'm listening to this conversation, and I'm listening, and I'm thinking in my head some of the experiences that I have had in just the recent past. Um, and I'm wondering, like you, Alice, like where did where did it go? Now, what did I do wrong? For just last month, for example, I hired and sent an, an offer letter to a person. On Friday, by Monday morning, he had accepted. He had accepted my offer. He took another offer on yeah. Monday. You know, and I'm like, wow! Like I literally had no time to onboard or do anything that was wrong to even to show that you know we're what made us not worthy. Mm-hmm. So so it was that quickly. You know, one whole weekend elapsed. But then there are also situations where. I was speaking to another entrepreneur early this morning, and she expressed that that you know there she didn't know what it was that she was doing wrong because she didn't feel like it was money that was the issue that not being able to hire you know a pay somebody. Now it is an issue to a certain point to where you might not be able to get the level of professional that you might need, or you may not have the budget to afford the number of people at once. But if you do have that one person that's been with you for a number of years and you've trained and they become like family to you, mm-hmm. and then there's one little piece that just, you know, attracts them to the next company, you know, how do you combat that as a small business owner? Like in our in the professional services world, there's not a kiosk that we might be able to use. You know, but I have found that um, gig services like Upwork may be an advantage now as a person who believes in economic development for my my city my company and my community that might not necessarily impact how i want it to go and i'm but there's but other large companies are using it they would it would not be so successful if that platform was not there i mean you see hundreds of thousands of people on Upwork in all kind of industries. You know, have y'all seen any any advantages in outsourcing work through gig services like that? Well, I'll, I'll just I'll just say, and then I'll definitely want to want to get Mel to take on. I think there there's something to be said for those companies such as Upwork and Fiverr who continue to have these great opportunities for gig employees and those who have these great skills. I think that's where our businesses, our small businesses are not really taking full advantage of those sources. And that's where we need to we need to back up a little bit to see how they can do more of that. Because right now, the gig economy that was spoke about is huge. But not only that, there are people with amazing talent that just decide they want to work at a coffee shop versus at an office building. And they don't want to worry about the parking and all of those things that come with that. So we've got to retrain ourselves as older professionals and more mature professionals as to how to attract people who decide they don't want the big office. They don't want to have to worry about the corner office and getting the gold watch at 30 years because that's not their issue. They want to be in a place where they have flexible hours, flexible ability to kind of pick up their kids when they want to go to the football game early on a Friday without being tied to a desk job. So I think we've got to look at this in a larger area and a more interesting area as how do we use these technologies, thereby contracting. And so I think that there is something to be said for that. And I would love to get Mel to take on it as well. Yeah, Alice, you're absolutely right. If I had three recommendations that I could give to organizations right now about what to do, um, one of them, and you just hit on it, is to be to embrace being a digital and agile organization. Don't expect the tradition of how we used to work 10 years ago. Because right. people, whether they are the millennials or the, the Gen um, X generation that's coming up, um, or the Gen Z, I mean, whoever it is, want to embrace technology and look at the new way of work. So being able and open to embrace, we've got a new way of work now. The third, the second thing is, is listening and taking action. So I had one of my clients is a uh, medical practice and they were having major turnover in the, in the midst of growth because they're expanding some of their products and services. And so one of the things that we implemented was to do, let's do some state interviews. Find out, you know, we do exit interviews on the on the outgoing side mm-hmm. of it, but why do people stay? So let's take the time to ask five or six simple questions on 
Why do you stay here? What makes you stay here? And what may attract someone with your skill set to want to come and stay with this organization and grow? And then the third thing is people really want work-life enhancement. You know, back in the 80s, we talked a whole lot about work-life balance and that whole balance thing. You know, I don't believe in the balance. I really do believe in having sound boundaries. And so making sure that we can meet the needs. We have all these stern policies um, that are very rigid around attendance. And this is when you need to clock in. You can't leave before that. And people just want a new way of work. And so my advice to managers who, who've been in that traditional mode um, and looking and thinking that visibility means work, my thing is switch from expecting visibility and go to accountability. As long as the work is getting done, like you said, Alice, it doesn't matter whether they're doing it at a coffee shop or at midnight or at 6 a.m. or 3 a.m., let them work in their most prime time and prime environments in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, and still get the work done. So, again, review how you are looking at the work being accomplished um, in your environment and what's possible to be able to spread out and let people work in their most optimal way. Yes. That may, that's, that's so right. That's so right. One of the things that when I, when I founded SARCOR, um, I found it with the principle that I wanted to allow my team members to have the flexibility to work from wherever. And why did I do that? Because I wanted to be able to work from wherever. You know, and so this was long before COVID. And I, and I actually put a post on my LinkedIn. Uh, there is a, I reshared a post from the Harvard Business Review. And I had a, a gentleman try to challenge me on the autonomy of being able to control your schedule. Well, I knew years ago when, long before I was even out of college, uh, that my, my brother had had a heart attack and he was 20. And I wanted to be able to come home and help with my family and be in school. I was also in college and I was also working a full-time job. I had a lot on my plate and my employer told me that I had to choose between my job and my family. Mm -hmm. And so, and I picked up my purse and I left mm -hmm. and I made it a point that once I began to have a family, I would make sure that I did not have to answer to that question of, of having to choose between my job and my family. And so using that philosophy, I made sure that I gave my team members that work with me the same type of autonomy. If they can get their work done mm -hmm. from, if, if they say they want to go to to the beach for a week, but they don't want to be in an office, they're still going to get their work done, right? The cloud allows us the flexibility to be able to do our work from wherever. They might not want to take their PTO because as long as it's getting done, it doesn't matter where it's getting done. Mm -hmm. It's just, I need production. And so being challenged by someone who is used to how things used to be and having to be in the office and saying, well, your employees don't deserve that right to autonomy was, I didn't agree with it because I didn't, as a wife and a mom, I want to be able to, if I want to go eat lunch with my kid, you know, I want to be able to do that and just make up my hours later. And I want my team members to be able to do the same thing. And I wish that that was something that could be translated into industries and retail and restaurants, because sometimes we need humans to have jobs. There are, there are jobs that are, that might not require a degree, but people are needed. Um, I was talking to a restaurateur a couple of months ago and he said, you know, a couple of years ago, we wouldn't want anyone that, may have nose rings everywhere and tattoos all on their face and their hands. But now he's, he's a, if they're breathing, we know they have a shot, you know? <laughs> and so thinking about that, um, Jagil, when you think about some of those challenges and you see how in professional services and in the service industry, for example, we may have that flexibility to embrace autonomy to with our team members. If an employer, who may be in retail or restaurant does not have that type of uh, that type of flexibility to give to their employees. How do you see it affecting the labor of human capital versus 
them making that investment in machine capital. I, I think a lot of people, when you look at when you look at automated technology, a lot of people fear that technology is going to take over the workforce, and we're going to go into this whole robotic uh, scenario where you're not going to have workers. But a lot of what we do, believe it or not, is not so much about replacing workers, but uh, making businesses more efficient. When you look at the labor and you look at the service industry uh, and you look at, you take, for example, uh, a subway, for example. Okay. So a subway, typically you come in, they have two workers and that, th those workers are fixing sandwiches. They're also taking the money at the cash register. Uh, so they're taking off the gloves and they're going to take payments. So we can make them more efficient to where those workers can actually just make the sandwiches and deploy those sandwiches and not have to worry about taking the payments. One of the things that we see, I, I spoke with the customer, uh, in fact, over in Georgia, and they have a, a smoothie shop and it's inside of a gym and they're doing very high volume during a particular period of time where they were looking for kiosks because the issue that they had was one of their workers were, were being overworked, overstressed. They were responsible for taking orders, taking payments, making the smoothies. And then they had these customers screaming down their ears. So this worker eventually got overstressed and quit. So what you see a lot in the workforce is not only uh, issues with, with being able to get help, but also being able to make that help comfortable while they're working. And that's why we implement a lot of automated technology as well, to be able to handle that balance of uh, high intensity volume as well as low intensity volume and kind of plateau that out and bring comfort to the workers as well as making them more efficient. Got it. So you, you dispelled a lot of myths with that because I have heard people say that it will take away from the labor shortage. And that's exactly why I asked that question so that you have the, the opportunity to let people know that it's to assist them, not to take away from jobs. And so, you know, we could talk probably for another two hours with this. This is probably a, a part two type of conversation. But since each one of you have so much to offer to small business owners, I would like for you to you know, just let us know how to contact you and so that you, if someone has other questions, you'll be available to them. Dr. Holloway, how can we contact you? Sure, sure. You can reach me. Uh, my, my website is skyconnect.com, S-K-Y-E-C-O-N-N-E-C-T.com. Or you can also find me at dralicegholloway.com on my new website as well. So uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I always try to connect on LinkedIn. So you can always find me there as well and on some of the, um, the social media sites as well. So thank you so for the opportunity. Really fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jagil, what about you? How can we find you? I'm always on LinkedIn. Also, you can find me on our website. Uh, that's mypiepos.com. Uh, you can always uh, leave a contact form or, or reach out or, or call our 1-800 number. And we'll be happy to help you. And keep in mind, his business is international. So small businesses uh, here in, in the continent of the U.S. and abroad, feel free to reach out to him. And Ms. Tate, how might we find you? Um, the, the easiest way is just Melba Tate. Dot com, but the um, official company address is TateAssociatesLLC.com, or you can just Google Melba Tate. I got one of those original names. You ain't going to find many of us out there. Thank goodness that my mama named me Melba, so you can find me on Google. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And, and for myself, you know, I can be reached at uh, on LinkedIn, Selena Rogers Dickerson, uh, as well as Instagram and Facebook is Selena Rogers Dickerson. So you all, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, your commitment to small businesses and to the community, the communities that you serve. You all are phenomenal people and I appreciate each one of you so much. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you, Selena. Thank you. So I hope you all had the opportunity to learn some practical solutions that you can implement don't be afraid to embrace technology. Don't be afraid to, to incorporate some of the services of the gig community, as well as automation for your services and your businesses. Things have changed quite a bit. And at the end of the day, we need to look at what the employee's lifestyle looks like and try to make sure that we incorporate what has happened in our society 
and make improvements so that our business continue to survive, thrive, and be sustainable. We want to make sure that you, ma'am, and sir, business owner, can continue into 2022 and beyond to live your wildest dreams and to be the blessings that you have been ordained to be. So to again, to find me, definitely reach out at selenarddickerson.com, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. My team and I, we are here to help you. It is not about what it is Selena can do for herself, but how I can be a servant leader to the community. Thank you so much and be the blessing.